Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We begin this week, Parshas Yisro, and to really adequately understand what's going on in Parshas Yisro, we also have to understand a little bit about Parshas Mishpatim, and you'll see why in a minute. The sheet that I gave you on one side, it's got some of the text from Parshas Mishpatim, some of the text from Parshas Yisro, and then there's some other interesting sources that we will get to. So one of the strongest cases for a secular Bible criticism in the Torah comes from the, this uh, recounting of the events of Parshas Yisro, Parshas Mishpatim of the giving of the Torah at Sinai. And if you look at Parshas Yisro this week and you look at Parshas Mishpatim next week, it would appear that maybe there was more than one author who wrote it, and that's what the Bible critics feel. So we will, we will see, we'll investigate this. But there seemingly are two different views and reports of the events of the Sinai revelation. And that's going to be the topic for today. In Parsha's Yisro, that's this week's Parsha, we have the, the giving of the Aseris Hadibros, the ten statements from Hashem, and we have one version of the accounts that led up to it. <coughs> While in Parsha's Mishpatim, there's a different version. So let's look at the two inside. We'll look at each one separately and try to get a sense of what was the mood. What was the feeling when the Torah, prior to the events of giving the Torah to the Jewish people, they came to the desert of Sinai on the first day of Sivan, the Torah was given on the seventh day of Sivan and in the five days in between Parshish Yisro gives us some of the events and Parshish Mishpatim gives us other of the events. So let's look at each one on its own and we'll get a sense of what's going on over here. So if you have the sheet in front of you, the first one, of course everything's backwards, the first one that says chapter 24 is Parsha Shmishpatim. Second one that says chapter 19 is Parsha Yisro. So let's take a look in Parsha Yisro. And we'll look at different things. For example, in Parsha Yisro, if you look in Pasuk Yud Beis, verse 12 is the beginning of the Jews being told to prepare for three days. And it says, Vigbalta sa'om saviv lemor, and you will separate, make boundaries for the Jewish people around the mountain, telling them, Be careful, do not, do not touch the mountain. Don't climb the mountain. Anyone who touches the edge of that mountain will surely be put to death. Okay, that, that's pretty strict. No hand should touch it. The person will surely be stoned. And no animal should go there either, etc., etc. Okay, so that's one understanding. Stay far away from this mountain. And then later on, at the bottom of the page, when indeed the events are, are getting to that day, and, uh, and the divine presence is ascending upon the mountain, so in Pasuk Chof Aleph, Verses 21 through 24, Hashem says to Moshe, go down and tell the people, warn the people, lest they'll be destroyed. And, and tell the Kohanim who are coming close, you know, don't, you know, don't, stay away, lest they break out a whole um, uh, punishment, etc., etc. The people cannot go. He, he, he reminds them and again and again. He says, nobody should come to the mountain. Okay, so this is already gives you kind of a this is my turf, stay off kind of talk. Okay? So that's one kind of feeling you get over here. Also, we know in verse 17 it says, when Moshe brought the people towards Hashem it's underlined, we have the words Vayisyatsvu betachti sohor and they stood at the bottom of the mountain now it's a very unusual way to write at the bottom of the mountain and therefore if you flip the sheet over source number three of the famous Gemara in Shabbos where the Gemara says that Hashem took the mountain of Sinai and raised it up over the Jewish people and turned it over to them on, on, on top of them like a bowl 
and said, if you accept the Torah, all will be well. If, and if not, here will be your burial place. So it sounds pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Pretty tough uh, in preparation for giving of the Torah. Go back to the verses 16 to 19 as it discusses what exactly happened on that day of the giving of the Torah. It says in verse 16, it says, On the third day when it was morning, there was thunder and lightning and a heavy cloud in the mountain, and the sound of the shofar was very powerful, and the entire people that was in the camp shuddered. Moshe brought the people forth, and they, and, and they stood at the bottom of the mountain, etc., etc., and, and Mount Sinai was smoking, because Hashem had descended upon it with fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of the furnace, and the entire mountain shuddered exceedingly. Sounds pretty scary. All right? So you, so you, you, you're getting, you're getting a, a feeling over there of, of how giving the Torah is? Well, what's your feelings about getting the Torah? You don't have a choice. Well, you don't have a choice. What else? There's penalties if you don't. Accept. Penalties if you don't. It's, it's very scary. It's very heavy-handed type of experience, okay? Not exactly what I call a user-friendly experience, okay? So if you're just looking at Parshas Yisro, that's the kind of feeling you get. Okay, do you, do you understand? Well, really, really, we should read through the whole thing, but that, that's really basically that sense that you get. On the other hand, as we go to the top of the page, Parshas Mishpatim, we find in Pasuk Dalit that Moshe builds a Mizbeach. Uh, he, he builds an altar. In verse 5 it says, Vayishlach es nare b'nei Yisrael vayalu olos. He sent forth youths of the Jewish people and they brought the burnt offerings. They brought it, it was youths that were brought to bring this. Uh, in the beginning of Pasuk Dalad, Moshe writes down the, the history of the Jewish people and he reads it to the people. He reads from the Sefer Torah, he reads a little bit of the Jewish history uh, in Pasuk Tes and in Pasuk Yud. It says, um, Moshe and Aaron and Nodav and Avi and the 70 elders come. And they and the and the and they and they saw the God of Israel, and under His feet was the likeness of sapphire brick, brickwork, and it was like the essence of the heaven in purity. And it talks about how how they how they ate and drank before Hashem. It's it's a it's a lot. Uh, the whole mood is totally different. You don't, you don't find any of the scary stuff. You understand? It's much more of a friendly communal activity that's going on over here. All right. Another important distinction we find in the book of this, this week's parsha. It says in pasuk Ches, I have it underlined, chapter 19, pasuk 8. Vayomru, and when Moshe brings the word from Hashem, you know, are you going to take the Torah? It says, Vayomru kol asher diber Hashem nase. Everything Hashem says, we will do. But back upstairs in Parshish Mishpatim, in verse number 7, it says, Kol asher diber Hashem nase v'nishma. Everything Hashem says, we will do and we will listen. Sounds like a different commitment the Jewish people are making. So that needs some elaboration. So that's two, two distinct differences we find in the two parshas. Now, let's turn the page and look at the Gomorrah Megillah. And we find something very fascinating. The Gomorrah Megillah, we know, was a very sad event in Jewish history where Talmai Philadelphus, who was a big bibliophile, he wanted to have a translation of the Torah into Greek. So he gets 72 rabbis, calls them in for an unknown purpose, he puts them in 72 different rooms and separately he instructs each of them to translate the Torah into Greek. And then they do that, but the Gemara then tells us not only they do that, but they each made a number of changes 
because they felt that Talmud Philadelphus would take great offense to some of the um, Torah if it was translated precisely. So they made a number of changes. A number of changes. Uh, one, for example, was one of the not kosher animals called the Arneves, which is the bunny. So the king's wife's name was Bunny, so they figured they better change the name, wouldn't look too good. <clears throat> and a great miracle happened. Uh, the great miracle that happened was that all the rabbis who made the changes, their changes were exactly identical and they didn't have text messaging to confirm what they were doing. Each were on their own. It was an unbelievable miracle um, that uh, they were able to each come up with the same change. There's a great rabbi who tongue-in-cheek says, you think that's a big miracle, a bigger miracle if you had all 72 in one room and they agreed to the same thing. That would be a bigger miracle. But anyway, but they all agreed to the change. So one of the changes, if you look on the, the on that source number two, on the right side, I'm just skipping over all the details, it says, they wrote, Vayishlach es za'atute b'nei Israel. And they sent the za'atute of the children of Israel. And za'atute was not the way it was written in the Torah. And again it says, Vel zatute b'nei solo shalchero. And against the zatute, Hashem did not put forth his hand. Really, if you look in our Chomish I read it already, it said, Na'are, the young lads. The young lads. It says, and, and the young lads brought a Corbin. Instead, the elders, when they, the 72 rabbis, they changed it from Na'are, from young people, to zatute. To, uh, like, noblemen, older, uh, uh, sagacious people so they changed that so the question is you know why was it so important that God had to make a miracle that they all changed it and they all came up with the idea like what what was the serious philosophical problem this is and they said children to bring a Corbin no it has to be Zatute and if they're and, 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 and God felt it should be written it should be written uh, children so if God, you know, felt it should be true, why can't we tell that to Talmud and leave it the way it is and say this is the way we have it? What was so terrible about this that they had to make such a big change? Okay, that's a third question. A fourth question, we know the famous question, where we already quoted, it, it's implicit in what we've already said. On the one end, the Jews said, Nasa Venetia, we'll do, we'll do, and then we will listen, which seemed they're completely willing to do it, but then we just quoted the measures that said Hashem had to put the mountain over their heads. Okay, there's answers. There's many answers to that question, but we want to explore another answer. And again, look, why, why are we splitting up the story? We have one story in one place and part of the story here, part of the story there. Why can't we put all the details in one story? Why in one part, one in the other? One. All right, that's enough, enough questions. So let's, let's analyze this and come with a very important uh, idea over here. Very often we'll have two versions of something in the Torah. We have, as many times. And the question is, how can we have two versions of the same event? So the answer is, we know, it's very possible at any given period of time to have a number of people be in a certain place, in a certain time, and they can relate to the experience differently. One person can have a certain feeling of what went on, and a second person has a different feeling of what went on. You know, let's say you're at a wedding, okay? You go to a wedding. So the chassan and kala can be really, really happy. The father who soon has to give a check for $50,000 to the caterer may have a different feeling, uh, especially when he knows he doesn't have the money in the bank to clear the check. Uh, you have some chassanim, some uh, grooms are on cloud nine, and other chassanim almost feel that, you know, oh my God, like what am I getting into? So, you know, a wedding has lots of different feelings and emotions in the same room over there. On the one hand, there's a sense of seriousness and responsibility, and on, another, and, uh, and on another, there's people relating to it with, with great joy. You can find a lot of, uh, you know, ladies crying at, 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 the, at the chuppah, and a lot of men are just smiling and having a good time. Like, what's going on? This is a funeral, is this is a wedding, I mean, what's going on? You look, but the answer is different. One event has different ways of projecting films different people. 
So, you know, different people relate to different things. You could ask people, you know, you could ask three different people, um, you know, uh, how, how, how was, uh, how was Shalashudis in Shul? And one guy will say, well, the Tvar Torah was amazing. Another guy will say, the singing was great. And the guy, the other guy will say, the Shmuel's hearing was amazing. So, and, that, and, they all, and that's what they come away from that event. So, so there, there are different levels that a person's trying to achieve. So a person will, you know, based on the schema where they're coming from, that's what they're going to be looking for. Fine. So we understand that that's a truism. So if the Torah conveys two different ways of relating to the events preceding to the giving of the Torah, so what is the Torah trying to tell us? The Torah is trying to tell us that there are obviously two different levels two different experiences for Jews at the Sinai revelation. And uh, maybe we have to relate to one of them, maybe we have to relate to both of them, but there are definitely two distinct experiences that are possible to have happened. And again, we have to remember what's important for us. Again, you always have to remember, so is this an ancient historical analysis? You've got to realize if the Torah was given, you know, all those years ago, and this is the Parsha where the Torah is given, so we all have to relate in our own sense to receiving the Torah. So we have a musical accompaniment now for the next hour of the work of fixing the bathrooms over there. So if you're wondering the noises. So uh, the uh, so we have to be experiencing ourselves. What is it? We're, we're coming to the end of the six-week period of Shovavim. And we're supposed to be traveling through the Jewish period of Bull's experience. We're supposed to be experiencing a freedom, the redemptions of freedom, tshuva, and it's culminating with how do we relate to Torah? At the end of the day, a person has to ask himself, how am I relating to Hashem? How am I relating to this Torah? How does it affect my relationship? What is my relationship to Torah and God's mitzvahs? If I was standing at the mountain, how would I be feeling this week and next week? So that's, so the feelings we're going to describe, we have to understand how do I relate to it and what would be the better way to relate to this. That's why this is an important idea over here. So let's go back to, to Yisro. Let's start with this week's Parsha and try to get what, what is the sense, why that's the sense, and do we relate to this kind of sense. So in, in Yisro, and it's certainly true about Torah in general, when we talk about Torah, okay, we're talking about something that the creator of the world is imposing upon us. It's an imposition of his will. Okay? And clearly the Medrash is saying that. He puts the mountain over their head, he says, you take the Torah, fine. If not, this is your burial place. This doesn't leave a lot of discussion over here. Okay. God decided that this is his world. This is, he decided these are the rules. He insists that we do this. And we really don't have a choice. There's not a lot of discussion over here. I'm the boss. And again, if you go through all the texts leading up to this, it's pretty clear. Hashem says, I, 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 I own the planet, man. Okay. He doesn't need our agreement. Um, he, he insists and he says, listen, you're in my house. You're a guest in this world. This is the way I want you to take care of my house. These are the rules of behavior in my house. This is my house. And if you don't like it, get out. There's nothing for discussion. It's not an you know, ecumenical uh, discussion over here in uh, uh, a pluralistic way of looking at Judaism. God says, this is the rules. Keep it or get out. That's it. Not, not a lot. Now, hopefully, hopefully God is reasonable. And we would assume that he made reasonable laws. But basically, he's not talking about any consent. He's imposing what he wants upon us. And that's certainly one way to look at the events of Harsina. Right? And, and, and that's what's going on over here. So that's one way of looking at Torah. On the other hand, Persis Mishpatim is also another concept. 
It's a concept more of a relationship with Hashem. And the word that really is important over here is that Hashem, as you see in Parsha's Mishvatim, Hashem makes a breeze. He makes a, a covenant, a bilateral covenant, covenantal relationship. Where, what does that mean? It means he has taken us for his people and also we have taken him for our God. And a relationship is being established over here. And we have accepted upon us his commandments, what he wants us to do, not necessarily as an imposition upon us, but rather, if you do this, then I'll do this for you. I'm interested in your welfare, and this is for your good, and then you'll do things for me, and I'll do things for you. You know, we say, well, listen, Hashem, if that's the way you feel about it, it's out us, that you're doing this for us, so we'll extend ourselves beyond what you're asking for us. And this is the idea of a bris. A bris, a covenant means you do this for me and I'll do this for you. And uh, the nature of a bris, you know, as seen in, in, in its, by its physical expression, it demonstrates that what, of what we're trying to achieve over here. And you find by Avram Avinu, Hashem made, made a bris with him. And he made a covenant and took the animals and they split up the animals. And, and a bris is really a new entity that comes, you know, from two people, two sides merging together and creating one new entity from the two parts it's becoming one entity. We find uh, that Moshe, it says over here in next week's Parsha, if you look in source number five, Moshe takes half the blood and half the blood is divided up and half the blood is, 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 is for the animal offering and half the blood is for the peace offering and is sprinkled upon the people. And the idea that, that the Malach splits it up exactly in half, that everybody's an equal partner in this relationship and we achieve a certain degree of unity over here. That's a very, you know, like blood brothers. Remember when you were little kids, right? You just give yourself a little... A little cut, and the, a frank little cut, and you merge the blood together, and now you're, you're, you're bosom buddies for the rest of your life. So this is the idea of a bris that Hashem is making with us, that uh, that we have a relationship going on over here. Okay, so there's two different feelings that are being projected. Yisro, I am the boss, these are the rules, and Mishpatim is, now we're developing a covenant. And both of us respect each other and love each other and will put out, put up, and put out for each other. These are two different feelings that are being expressed. Now, the truth is they're both 100% true. It's, it's certainly true in a marriage, same way. Uh, on, on one level, there are things that are imposed upon us in marriage. Uh, you know, go to the traditional marriage. Uh, nowadays, there's nothing true about anything in marriage but the old traditional form of marriage you know the husband you have an obligation to support your wife according to Torah law it still applies right you know you, you're getting into marriage the, the Torah imposes upon a husband you must take care of your wife you must work and you must pr produce the finances that are necessary and he has basic responsibilities and a wife has certain responsibilities that she has to do and if you plan on getting married to this woman and you don't plan on working you're not you're not getting married and if you plan on being married to this man you you have to enable him to have children and if you don't plan on that you're not getting married you don't have a choice that's what marriage is there are things that you are being imposed upon to do. And if you're not willing to be imposed, then there is no marriage. That's on one level. But on the other hand, you know, beyond that, there ought to be a certain feeling of that we are developing a relationship with each other. That it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's understood, you know, I, I'm going to do for you and I'm going to extend myself and it's not just what's written in the contract, it's beyond what's written in the Ksuva and uh, beyond what it says in the Shulchan Aruch. But if you love someone, you do a little bit more for that person. We explained on Shabbos the idea of Hidur Mitzvah, you beautify the Mitzvah, right? So there's, there's even in marriage, there, there's two aspects and it's not a contradiction, it's not a contradiction. 
there are certain basic things which have to be and beyond that there are certain feelings of acceptance that we're entering into a relationship where, where there's a, a dimension of it where I'm not imposing things on you this is the way I'd like things to be this is what I'd like you to accept I'd like you to have certain feelings for me and I hope that will come forth from your feelings to me but we're not imposing things okay so this really is the basic difference between the concept of this week's parsha that you say Nase we will do and the other concept of Nase Venishma we will do and we will listen there's a big difference in this week's parsha, when the Jewish people say every, Hashem whatever you say Nase we will do well you know Hashem has come across them and says you better do this I'm imposing upon this either you take it or the world is turning back to the way it was before creation back to the empty void so the Jews accepted it and that's it Nasa will do <laughs> that's what you want us to do that's what we're going to do so in terms of imposing upon us I have to keep Shabbos I have to keep Shabbos I have to keep kosher, I have to keep kosher. There's nothing more to say. Will you do it? Yes, I'll do it. That's all. But in terms of the second aspect, nasa v'nishma, you really have to understand, what do the words nasa v'nishma mean? Nasa will do, v'nishma we will listen. So the, the simple meaning, people say, is, listen, we'll, we'll do it even before we heard what we have to do. Which is always difficult to understand. How can you do if you don't know what you have to do? you'll do it and then you'll understand it uh, ok so, so you'll do it and then you'll understand what does it mean and then you'll understand it like the reasons the and, and if you don't understand the reasons you'll still, you'll still do it so then what do you need the nishma for well, so some say ok like you're saying ok I don't understand why I'm doing it but eventually I will understand why I'm doing it it doesn't apply to, it doesn't apply to all mitzvahs there's a lot of mitzvahs that are chukim we, we, we said over there it says kol asher diber Hashem nasa v'nishma everything Hashem says we'll do and listen we're not going to understand everything so I, I think the real pshat is nasa v'nishma it means another dimension we will do and then we will sense from our doing the reality of what you're really asking us to do meaning to say that when we do a mitzvah after a while you know if you look at the al Sheikh, the al Sheikh he discusses in this week's parsha says Vayish Ma Yisro and Yisro listened you know the word Shama listening just doesn't mean the fact that your ears are hearing something Nishma really means you, you have a total connection to what those words are all about you really internalize the message now, Yisro heard what happened the whole world heard what happened but nobody decided to convert he decided to convert because the words got into his kishkes he internalized the, the, this, what, what does this really mean so, and then he realized this is really significant that this is something worthwhile to become part of so the same idea in Nasa Venetia we do miss this and after a while we, we develop a sensitivity to the feeling of the mitzvah to the value of the mitzvah how it gives us feelings of totally being feeling completed inside feelings of holiness a sense of how right uh, the mitzvah actually agrees to what we're all about you may not know exactly but you know this, this feels right it doesn't feel like an imposition anymore it's something we totally relate with and that and that's the the level that the Jew was hoping to reach so Nasa Venetia doesn't mean I'm going to do it and then I'm going to listen and study but most of all Nasa means we'll do Nishma and then we will perceive after doing the reality which which which, which is trying to be conveyed to us through these mitzvahs well, let me give you an analogy to make it a little clear let's say a father tells a son to do something father tells a kid to do something and the kid doesn't understand it so he does it but as he grows older he begins to understand how right that was for him I don't know why my father made me work summers while all the other kids went to camp but I did it 
Then when a kid's 30 years old and is a successful businessman, and he's a guy who has a sense of responsibility, Nishma, now I understand. It makes a lot of sense. Why well, I, I developed a certain work ethic. I didn't feel that I had, uh, things were coming to me, right? Uh, you send a kid to school, you know, and the kid's screaming and yelling, but you force him to go to school. But then when he grows up, he realizes it was a good idea, went to school. So, so in Judaism, what's happening is, in the beginning, we have to accept Hashem's imposition. Right? Hashem says you can't steal. Hashem says you have to keep Shabbos. Okay, I don't have a choice. But after a while, after you keep Shabbos for a while, you want to be able to, to feel that, you know what, this is really amazing. It's really amazing. Again, as these two aspects, I keep coming back to Shabbos. I'm sorry to belabor it every week, but this is, uh, I'm becoming more and more convinced this is where the battle of Yiddishkeit is being won and lost. And unfortunately, most Orthodox Jews are losing this battle. Right. This, this is the key battle. You know, there, there's the Nasa aspect of Shabbos and there's the Nasa Venishma aspect of Shabbos. Right. Nasa means we'll keep the Shabbos. Okay, you imposed it upon us, we have to keep it, right? You made the rules. You want to be a Jew? You want to be blessed? <laughs> this is what you got to do, you got to keep Shabbos. You don't keep Shabbos, then you know, all kinds of problems are going to happen. Okay, you don't keep Shabbos? Most you must. If there are two witnesses, we stone you. Okay, oh, I got a choice. I'm going to keep Shabbos. Right. An Orthodox Jew wouldn't think of desecrating the Shabbos. But, but they still don't hear why it's so good. They, 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 okay, the boss says you do it. You do what he wants. You do what he wants. But, but to begin to realize that you know what? Shabbos is everything. I, I, I really hear that Shabbos, Shabbos opens up my soul. It's the day of the soul. It's the day that I come totally in touch to my reality. It's the day I really can sense how much Hashem loves me. So that's something you gotta, Nishma, you gotta hear it. It's not even something that can be explained to you. It's not something that can be explained to you. You can't explain it. If, if you don't feel it, you don't have it. That, that's the real nishma. And, and as I said, and how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Very simple. How much, how much do you look forward to the shops? If it's imposed, is it the happy prison sentence? Right? Or is it something I'm dying to do? So how do you know? How, how quick, how early are you ready for shops? If it's the last minute, then you're saying loud and clear it's imposed. Because, believe me, if God would have given you an one hour less, you'd be happy to take it. What would be if the rabbis in Toronto one day got up and made a big, we made a big decision, we, we met for hours, we saw how hard it was. For now on, Shabbos is going to be one hour less. 99% of Jews will be cheering and making a parade. Baruch Hashem, the rabbis made it one hour less. One hour less of the happy prison sentence, and we're still good Orthodox Jews. Right? But, but, they, but a, a good you would hear, what, one hour less of, of vacation? <laughs> one hour less of feeling this good connection to Hashem? What are you talking about? We want 10 hours more. Right? That, 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 that's the difference. So if, if Shabbos is Nasa, then if Shabbos is out this week at 624, then that's the end of the happy prison sentence. I, I do what I have to do. I don't want God to stone me. I don't, if, I, if I would drive 10 minutes earlier, he'll get me in an accident. So I'm not going to do it. I don't have a choice. He's got the mountain over my head. But if Nishma, I really hear that Shabbos is most amazing, that, then, I, then I sense it's for my best interest, and, I, and I'm feeling close to Hashem at this time, so why am I rushing away from it? Right? So that, you, you understand? So, so there, there's one way of looking at it as a Nasa a relationship, an imposed relationship, or a Nasa Vinishma. It's a whole different commitment. It's a whole different commitment. You're not looking at the watch. And that's the way it is for all mitzvahs. So you have many Jews who do mitzvahs because it's imposed. And things that are imposed, you usually don't enjoy doing them. Unless they happen to be things you enjoy. But otherwise, you're not going to enjoy doing them. And you'll always look at a minimalistic way of doing them. You're always looking for a way out of it. You look at young kids who don't really know how to daven properly, they want to be out there as soon as possible. 
don't want to spend too much time davening. Somebody who really understands what prayer is and feels what prayer is, you can't stop them from praying more and more and more. It's the same idea. So, so there's two levels of Kabbalah. The Torah is, is being very clear. This is the beginning of the people. So the Torah is giving us one way of looking at, at what, what Torah means to you or another way of what Torah means to you. And as we read these parshas, we have to self-reflect and say, which, which parsha do I relate to? That's the question you have to ask yourself.